evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Barrett Ships and Dorm for BSD Grand City. This is Director General of the Corps of Women, the 502nd Air Base Wing Commander, and the Joint Base Standing Wing Commander. Joining General Women today are Chief Lan Tang, the Command Sergeant of the 502nd, Major General John Devoe, 59th Medical Wing Commander, Colonel Sam Fields, sorry, the, uh, the Fort Sam Houston Installation Commander or Executive Agent, Captain John Dial, the Staff Judge Advocate Representative, and Mr. Richard, Richard Trevino, the 502nd Civil Engineer Director. Here's your dinner for today. General, General Elizabeth and the panelists will be uh, taking this opportunity to brief you on the actions they have taken as well as the way that the role for mediation as well as BSD improvements. And they will also be giving you up the opportunity to ask your questions during the upload and forum. And during the open forum, the best to facilitate conversation in a couple of round rules. First, we want to uh, honest and candid feedback, but we please request uh, that you uh, make the best more. Second, when we want to ask a question, please come up to the mic, uh, and I'll be there to assist and uh, help on the line. Second, we will be videotaping if you have a notice, so if you have any issues with that, please get with the PA representative, and the PA can raise your hand, and we will help with editing um, any of you guys out. And then lastly, again, we're here for your questions, so please, we really do want you to feel free and um, um, get your feedback. Questions? So why, so why are we here? We're here because we want to hear your concerns and the leadership generally wants to know and wants you to feel free to voice concerns. So please take this opportunity to voice those concerns and uh, so, so that leadership can best with you. Like this. So with that, General Lindsay will now uh, start the question. Thanks, Mr. Commander. If we could go back one slide, just want to emphasize a point here that uh, we do want you to be honest, we want you to be transparent, and it's not attributional. If you'd like that, we don't want your name or uh, where, you, where you were, but we don't want any of that um, recorded. That's why the PA folks are here, they can edit to do you and your portion out. But also, it's not attributional. I know that was a concern for some of the folks that have come up online, that they didn't want to say anything or they didn't want to report what's going on in the rooms because they were afraid they were going to get in trouble or even get washed back in training. So that was something that has come up throughout our, our investigation and our inspections over the last couple of weeks. So we just want to introduce or emphasize to you all that there is no retribution. We can't fix things if we don't know what's going on in the morning. So we really do want to hear what's on your mind today. And so with that, I am Brigadier General Laura Lindemann. I'm the 502nd Air Base Wing Commander and also the Air Base Wing Commander. That means that I'm responsible for Fort Sam Houston, Randolph, Fast, and Campbell. So a lot of you have also trained in Campbellus, so if there's any concerns about the facilities or um, the dorms or the barriers or the ships or the up there, so please let me know if you're going to take good notes and get out there as much as possible. Next slide. So what have we been doing? All right, so first, the last couple of weeks, many of you are aware, um, you wouldn't be here otherwise, um, that there was a social media posting that elevated our concerns about the mobile dorms and the ships in there. And I just wanted to emphasize that this is something that my team, our team, our collective team, and your leadership have been working on since I took command last year. It's not new to us that we have trouble with norms. We have HVAC problems. We have humidity problems. We have leaks. We have older facilities. We have newer facilities that weren't made properly. So these are the challenges that we are facing, and we have been facing them for many years. Unfortunately, it's coming to a head right now, but it's an opportunity. And that's what I want to also emphasize here is that this is an incredible opportunity for us to do the things that we've been trying to, not only myself, but my predecessors, um, over the last couple of years, and especially over the last 20 years that the Department of Defense has been taking risk in infrastructure. And so not to get too far into the weeds about where our resources go, but we've been in a budget crisis over the last couple of years, and this is one of the areas where our department collectively has said we need to focus on the wars overseas, we need to focus on the weapon systems, we need to focus on the equipment for the soldiers, the sailors, the marines, and airmen. And we're going to take a little bit of risk here in this infrastructure piece. And it's only recently that we've said we can't take any more risk, and it's coming to a head right now as we speak. So this is an opportunity. I just want to emphasize that, that things 
Very simple fix um, on the surface. So we, we had a, about three or four hundred on hand. 
distributed those. Um, we have another 1,600 that we're trying to order rather quickly. Um, so hopefully some of you will see those in your rooms. If you won't see them in your rooms, you might see them in your hallways. Because sometimes your rooms can't handle the load, the electrical load on the actual uh, system right now. But we're actually having a contract of electricians coming in to help us with that problem too. So ideally we're going to get a date time to the dehumidifier in as many rooms as we can, especially the ones that are able to handle the load. We'll be installing ceiling fans when it's applicable for the rooms that are more prone to be uh, mold uh, susceptible. We're replacing carpeting when we can, because again, this is just another place for mold to grow. Um, so we're replacing carpeting with uh, vinyl tile for vinyl planks. And we're cleaning the rooms. We're helping uh, folks that may not uh, be able or may not know how to clean their rooms or haven't been able to clean their rooms. We're helping them with the supplies. We're helping them uh, to show us a touch place with some mold and the actually going to grow. So we, that's kind of our first line of defense. It's all the folks here who can help us keep that humidity and keep that garden in the We also developed a remediation website. So we'll, we'll release all of these things. <coughs> Facility maintenance are those things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis 
so we can resolve the issues no different than your house or no different than maintaining your car. Changing the oil, maintaining that your car has its standard maintenance requirements, meaning that checking air pressure, changing out your air filters, doing those types of things. That's what we have to focus on. So again, what are the three big things that we need to do to mitigate or minimize mold or mildew growth? Temperature, humidity, and airflow. Those are the three big things. So in order to address it, the first thing we did was basically when you call in a requirement, so whether that is a unaccompanied housing or a facility, we want you to tell us it's not just an HVAC issue or an HVAC is out. If you truly see mold in your facility, I want you to use that four letter word. I want you to tell me, I see mold, I see mildew, I need to know that. Because HVAC and plumbing, they're a higher priority. Well now, mold is a higher priority. What that means is we treat it as, a, as an urgent requirement that we have to go and physically put eyes on it to make certain that it is something that isn't truly an immediate health issue yesterday. So it's something that I have to go out there and mitigate right now for doing facility maintenance action. This is where I have a leaking faucet where I actually have something coming down from the third floor down to the second floor where I have water coming down and that moisture is creating a problem for the facility. Is it that critical? Okay, that's going to be the first and foremost. When you tell us that there's a problem, tell us specifically more of what is it. And what I've done is we've restructured our organization in terms of our customer service that, to ask those questions. When they ask an HVAC issue, when they ask a plumbing issue, it should automatically be, is there potential for vulnerability? So that's where you can help us, okay? The other piece of it is, is that in terms of the preventive maintenance, that's coming upon us again. If you're not changing the oil in your car every three to 5,000 miles, eventually your car is going to go back, right? So that's my responsibility. That's my staff responsibility to make sure that we are, as your living has indicated, I'm changing out the filters on a consistent basis that it did not get clogged. That I am going to prevent it to make sure that the exhaust fans are in fact working. Those are the things that are indicative of what I have to have my staff do. So that's why that standard preventive maintenance is also very equally important. No different than your own household. If you have your own house and you don't change your filters and your HVAC it starts getting warmer, you may think you may have a compressor problem. In reality, it's usually your your air vent or your air filters are just clogged up and change them, then you can solve the problem. Those types of things. We also take a look at what we have done is for the entire JPSA, we have dedicated manpower internal to my entire group. Specifically for dormitories, barracks, and ships. Period. That's their whole job. That's their only job. They don't do anything else. Again, it's part of the preventive maintenance and the responsiveness for us to go to meet the demand signal to take care of the facilities and probably take care of our customers. So their job is that 100%. They don't get pulled off. They don't get to do anything else. That is their primary focus. That is their only job. So when we go out there and do work, for those that if you have a facility manager, those facility managers will see my staff on a pretty regular basis. And that helps us go through that preventive maintenance cycle to make sure that I'm not waiting for you to call me that the building needs to work. I'm getting ahead of it. Again, that's preventive maintenance portion. Okay? Also looking at, so other things that we're looking at doing internal is we have a lot of backlog of work orders. We have, we have a lot of work. So I'll give an example. During the summer uh, season, we average about four to 500 HVAC calls a week. And that's a lot, but if you look at the work, if you look at the Jamie's State portfolio, I mean, that's not unreasonable, especially with the facilities that we have. Our infrastructure is old. Our infrastructure can range anywhere from 1800s to 1920s, 1930s, you know, 1980s, 1990s, even some of our early in the 2000s. So that's the kind of infrastructure that we're dealing with. It's not all pristine, it's just some of it's historical, but that's our responsibility to work with us. So as we go through that, we want to make certain that we have the ability to handle those different types of facilities. So for us, your involvement in submitting the work orders is going to be that much further. The ability for us to have those dedicated teams allows us to better understand that infrastructure. Okay? Now how do you do that long term? How do we say, okay, I have an HVAC system that just quite honestly is just not working? I, you know, I can use both on bailing wire, it's just not going to work, right? There's only so much duct tape we can use. 
Well, that's a long term piece. That's the infrastructure piece. So back when General Lemon came and took command here, we implemented and developed a dorm training campus improvement plan where that now tells us we're going to forecast every one of our facilities, barracks, ships, dorms, across the JPSA enterprise to say, how are we going to fix it long term? And that's an investment. So as she indicated before, OSD took risk in infrastructure, and we know that. But we're at the point now where we're pushing and we have buy-in to say now that investment has to be paid. And that's what we're working towards right now. So what does that mean? That means it's no longer just going out there and changing out filters. It's actually changing out data <coughs> It's taking the entire building in some cases, taking it down to the bare studs, and fixing it. Upgrading the electrical, upgrading the mechanical, upgrading, making it compliant with ADA, fire, safety, the whole game. Because I can put little pieces of work every now and then, but eventually we have to do a complete whole house renovation for these facilities. That's the whole thing. So right now we have about 35 to 40 plus projects getting work from about you know, 90 plus million. Long term we have about 200 million plan from 21 to 25. Factoring in every year we have a project, actually several, to deal with barracks, chips, and dormitories. So whether it's technical training, whether it's permanent party on the company, or whether it's training facilities, whether it's defects, you'll see that in our portfolio. And we're pushing those because we have to make that investment. Next slide, please. So we wanted to also do is, as we look at the long-term piece, we also looked at, as we did the inspections, there were things that we, within our particular uh, Resident managers or our dorm managers, we had to go through a little different. So, one of the things we're going to do is take our resident user guide and we're going to update it. And we're going to provide additional helpful hints because as we look through it, there are just some things that, that we're just missing. For example, again, temperature. Keep the temperature between 72 and 74 degrees, right? That may sound simple, but sometimes it's not. Where just reminding folks to one, leave it on even if you're not in the room. That's a plus. Because then I can regulate the temperature. And don't take your, don't put your thermostat down to 65 because that's actually a bad thing. Because that actually creates moisture because it's too cold. So when you see, if you go into your rooms and you see moisture around your windows, that's because your temperature setting is just too, too low. And we're not regulating that thermostat, okay? So those are the things that we're looking at to provide helpful hints. Getting that ventilation, we need, if you have, for instance, if you have closets, open up your closet doors. If you have bathroom doors, if you're not using them at the time, leave those doors open, open up your shower curtains. Those types of things will help just get that airflow in, open up your windows when it comes to sunlight. Believe it or not, sunlight actually, you know, prevents mold from, it's another inhibitor. Those simple things will help us go a long way. It, it may sound like, yeah, really doesn't help. Cumulatively, it actually does that. Okay? So those are the things that we're talking about in terms of just helpful hints that we're going to go back and better work with the facility managers, work with the residents to make certain that we are giving you the best advice out there and try to help us work it collectively until we can get the long-term fixes in place. Because at, at the end of the day, um, you're our first line of defense. So if you see something out there, please let us know. I, mean, I can't foot stomp that enough. That's going to be our biggest way to know that there are issues. Okay. Is that? Any other questions?
I've got uh, students in Metsi, so we have a group in Metsi, a lot of Metsi students, maybe some of them are here. I have dorm dwellers in the bedroom and then a Kubo that work at the Brook Army Medical Center, and then I've got some at General Lenderman's dorms at Blackland as well. So in addition to being a medical advisor, um, I'm also a commander that is concerned about my folks' welfare, and, uh, and, and so I, I will just say up front that I am very comfortable from a health standpoint of Air Force medics staying at JVSA dorms based on what Richard just said, Mr. Trevino, the civil engineer expert, and, and General Lenderman's team. So what about mold? Mold is everywhere. It's been around for millions of years on our planet. Uh, outside now, floating in the air, if you look up Ken's or KSAT, there'll be a mold count for spores that are in the air. So it's everywhere. So if you're walking around outside, you'll have a few on your uniform and you know, you'll bring them into your house. As long as your house, though, is not warm and really moist with a lot of humidity and leaky faucets or, you know, water everywhere, that mold is not going to grow. So if you remove the mold, the, the moisture, the mold stops growing. So everything that you heard Richard talk about and General Lenderman talk about is involved with, okay, let's make sure that uh, we reduce the humidity. So in some cases, we may have to give you a dehumidifier and increase the airflow. So don't keep moist damp clothes that you just took off from being outside working out or sweating, you know, OCP like I have right now because it's 107 degrees outside. Putting that on the floor or in the closet and shut the door, no matter how good the HVAC is, it, it, it may turn moldy. So remove the moisture, the mold stops growing. Mold is, you know, contrary to what you, you hear in the news and kind of scary internet stories, in reality, it doesn't cause a problem for the majority of people. So, you know, in the fall, you know, in November or December, you're going to see kind of a yellow sheen on your car from the mountain cedar pollen. And some of you may sneeze and get allergies to mountain cedar, but others of you do not. And mold is an allergen like mountain cedar is, and some people are going to be very allergic to it and sneeze, itchy water guys are going to show up in our primary care clinics, and maybe even need to see an allergist and maybe get some shots to desensitize them from that. So the, the more common things, if you're sensitive to it, runny, stuffy nose, kind of like cold symptoms. And frankly, if you were to come into the clinic to see me or any of the other providers uh, on JVSA, if you didn't say that you were exposed to mold, we would probably just call that the common cold or maybe seasonal allergies. So, one of the things that you can help us describe, you know, the problem is to say, you know, I'm, I'm in a dorm room and they said there was mold there or I saw mold and they came and cleaned it. Uh, but we still wouldn't treat you any differently. You know, antihistamines, maybe something for, uh, you know, a stuffy nose, etc. If you have asthma, uh, you know, it can cause an asthma flare. But most of the folks that we assess into the military, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, don't have a history of asthma, but some people acquire it when they come into the military. And so, you know, if, if you had an asthma flare, uh, you know, that, that would be a little more concerning, but we can treat that too, and we can desensitize you if you're that allergic to mold. So, thus far, we've had only, you know, 10 or 20 patients come in with clear symptoms that uh, seem to be related to the, you know, being in a particularly moldy <coughs> room. And to my knowledge thus far, no one has come in with an asthma exacerbation. That toxic or black mold is, it sounds scary, but it's inaccurate. And so, uh, President Reagan used to say in the, in the 80s when, you know, dealing uh, with negotiating with the Russians at the time about nuclear arms, trust but verify. So I, I want you to trust me in what I'm telling you, medical advice, but I want you to check me. So on the next slide, give me the next slide, please. I've, I've got some links here for you where you can look up and so that I'm not, I'm not you know, blowing smoke at you, that this is really bad. And, and so there's some EPA guidance that we've given you a link to. The single best one that I think uh, 
is the, the, from the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control. It's not written for an infectious disease expert or even, even an old internal medicine doc like me. It's really written for anybody, uh, whether you've had you know, a flood or a hurricane that's you know, damaged your home or you just don't have a really good working air conditioning unit and you've got some mold in the home. And so it's got facts about it and it'll say, you know, get rid of the mold and you can use a, a diluted bleach solution or if you're kind of a, uh, sensitive to that, you can use a diluted vinegar <coughs> solution. Uh, and the CDC will say in mold print that there is no value for testing for a certain type of mold. There's white molds, there's green molds, there's black molds, and in otherwise healthy people, uh, there, there is really very little risk at all, uh, with the exception of allergy kind of things, and, the, and maybe, again, if you have asthma, a flare of that. The people that I get concerned about are people that have an abnormal immune system. So uh, if, if you have cancer, uh, if you're being treated for cancer, chemotherapy, leukemia, Hodgkin's, if you have a, a condition that requires steroids to decrease inflammation, those things put you at an increased risk for any infection to include mold. If you have chronic lung disease uh, for any cause, you know, cystic fibrosis or 40 years of smoking, that can be a problem. But for otherwise young, healthy people, I, I told the TV cameras and the media a week ago that there are no young people have them been, have, that are otherwise healthy have them been, there have been severe medical problems from just the mold exposure that we've seen around here. So I, I believe that the CDC recommendations and the guidelines are the summary of the best evidence that's out there. And I would encourage any of you to, again, don't just take my word for it. Go to that CDC, cdc.gov, mold, frequently asked questions, facts about mold or dampness in your home. To explain how you could, you know, clear it out yourself and what the risk is. And don't recommend that you should send it out to a reference lab. So that, you know, we know what the typical types of mold are. And one type isn't worse than another type for normal, healthy people. Uh, so, th there are similar guidelines from the American Academy of Allergy and Immunology. And so the, the last thing is, if, if you feel like you've got any health considerations at all, whether they're related to mold or otherwise, use your health care benefit. And so we've got a permanent party. You can make an appointment there. If you're a basic medical trainee, so we, we've tried to cover everybody. I probably, my guys probably wrote this more for airmen. But, you know, if you're a soldier here, you know, the Moreno Clinic, the Troop Medical Clinic, any of the permanent party, Army, Navy, or Air Force, just go tell them that you think your symptoms may be associated with mold exposure. And, you know, we've got a whole protocol written. And the uh, JBSA is blessed to have a, a lot of allergy resources. The Army and Air Force's largest training program for allergy experts is at Brook Army Medical Center a combined Air Force and Army program. The two senior allergists in the Air Force are here in town. They agree with what I've told you, but again, don't, don't take my word for it. If you have symptoms, go and see your provider. Check these things out if you have any questions. So I'd be pleased to take any questions right now. And if you have any recommendations about how to improve the Red Sox pitching, I will take that also. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just thank you for all that you're doing uh, for you know, many of you are medics I know and for taking great care of our patients and uh, uh, again uh, you can ask me questions afterwards if you don't want to in front of the whole group here or you can send me an email thank you great. hang in there one more slide and you're done I'm going to turn it over to our judge advocate, Niles. Alright, good evening, everyone. So, my focus as the JAG in this whole process has been on claims, whether that's personal property or issued military. Those are the two categories. 
So anytime your property is damaged, incident to the service, in this case, the service because of the accident storm, you're entitled to file a claim to seek compensation to replace that item with a fair market value. So uh, what we have done, I have coordinated with all, all three bases, uh, the Plavis and ISG, the Plavis or uh, SFG, and the FSG here at Fort Sam. Uh, they've all worked really hard with this mission here. Uh, several other folks on compiling data and information, not just for Air Force folks, but for uh, sister services as well, uh, to get one, uh, a one-stop claim shop for everybody. So to streamline the process as much as possible. We heard a lot of complaints about it being sort of cumbersome to go in and file a complaint. So we heard that, and we tried to make it as simple as possible. So the, I think we're back on slide four, the ATTC, uh, Bold remediation site that has a link on it. You can click on that link, and it's the entire claim package. And that has everything you could possibly need for filing your claim. Um, and then three, there are three ways to do that. So one is online through the Air Force Claim Service Center website. One is you can mail in a hard copy packet. And the third way is you can just go to your servicing legal office. They can either help you through filing it online or help you through the hard copy. There's also a checklist in there that folks work with the Claim Service Center to specifically for this normal crisis. So if you just follow that checklist, you should be good to go and file your claims. Um, there is a separate process, like I mentioned, for issued military items, uh, uniform items, things like that. Uh, and that's an Air Force Form 659. I don't know what the equivalent is for the sister services. But that's processed through your chain of command. So you can download that from ePubs. You can fill that out, process it through your chain of command, and get those issued military items. The Claim Service Center is just for personal property, so everything from you know, pillows, blankets, uh, personal clothes, I've heard somebody ask about a motorcycle helmet, a violin case, all of that stuff falls into personal property, and you can potentially seek reimbursement for it. Um, the one caveat is you have to, if it can be cleaned, you have to try and clean it, uh, with the exception of something that's like porous and uh, sort of made of material, something like a pillow, you don't have to try and clean a pillow. That's just a little too difficult to determine if it's entirely clean. Uh, but something like a t-shirt that you can wash, something like that, you, you've got to give it a shot. If it comes out, it's still stained or ruined or something like that, then you have to file your claim. Uh, some things are a little easier, like the motorcycle helmet I mentioned. You can probably just wipe that down, but again, if you give it a go, and it doesn't get clean, you can file your claim and all that stuff. So we conducted seven legal workshops across uh, both Randolph, or all three of Randolph, Blackland, uh, and Fort Sam. I think we uh, ultimately briefed over 1,100 people again with great assistance from the, the service and legal office in each base. Um, and the, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is either go to that, that claims workshop or the, the claims packet that's on the ATC website or go to your service and legal office and they'll walk you through everything. Uh, we, we've been spoken with them about fast tracking your normal uh, legal assistance clients. So if you go ahead and say you know, they're normal, uh, in theory they should bring you from the line to make sure they get that claim process for you. The Claim Service Center says it takes about 10 days once the claim is actually filed to make a determination uh, on the payment of that claim. So it's actually pretty quick too. Um, and, and the last thing I'll highlight for you is one of the things we created with the Claim Service Center was a standard login and password to uh, make that process a little quicker and easier for people. But that's only good for about 55 more days. We can only get it good for about 60 more days. You have a two-year statute of limitations on filing your claim, so don't feel like you have to do it in the next two months. But just know that the, the information will change a little bit in about two months to reflect the updated logging and passwords. So that's claims in a nutshell. Does anybody have any specific questions about that? Well, thank you.
Brandon Storm, Andrew Harwick, and 188th Medical Battalion. I appreciate you uh, coming out here and doing this this evening. I was here as a student back in 1992, uh, living in the building 1350, and there were issues back then. So these are a lot of these are long standing. And I appreciate the way you described the, the challenge and the constraints that have hampered our ability to get after some of these problems. So I, my question is simple. In the future, as you see possibly this um, issue being attacked, will there be uh, money, and this may be beyond us, that can be set aside to build new barracks? For instance, the ones that like actually go on in those, they're outstanding. And I, I appreciate what's going on in 1350 and the way that's being upgraded. It's an open bay area, and it's a lot easier to manage. I always like it. HVAC and all are addressed, we can stay ahead of that. But some of the buildings, as you, like 2791, uh, it, it just has problems. Problems. The HVAC has been replaced. That's great. I'm not rambling. So what I'm trying to get to is that I, I just want to see if there's any forecast in future projects that will give the Army maybe, maybe the barracks. Exactly. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I'm going to as for, for our civil engineer to chime in there, but I completely agree with you when you're describing the things, the challenges that you're seeing here, or we're seeing here today, um, they're not new challenges. Um, we have projects in the works right now. Part of what's happening in this, in this particular moment is we do have a lot of renovation work going on at the same time. So that's one of our findings is maybe we need to do a little bit more homework and strategy in terms of what bones we bring down so we have more swing space. It doesn't answer your question, but it does provide us more flexibility when we have things that, that break in the middle of the night, when we have rooms that are chronically down for whatever issues those are. So that's one of the lessons learned. Um, and your question is one of the ones that our boss is, my boss is asking us to. Um, so his question is, how confident are you that this isn't going to reoccur? And then the next question is, what do you need? And so what we've done is we've developed a wish list of things that we want to accomplish. And we already started that with that drama training campus plan. Um, so now we've, we've codified it and we've elevated it up to our commander um, in terms of these are the things that we need to pay attention to. And within our own community, we have projects on the books, but I think there's an opportunity to add more, especially when it comes to the technical, we call technical training norms. But the, the, the norms that we're having the most challenges right now are not basic military training over at Backland. It's that next level of training like you have here at Fort Sam and at Backland. Those are the majority of the issues. Um, so with that, if I could, which if you have any specific things that we're going to address for Fort Sam in terms of the building projects that we have on the books or the ones that we're looking at? Thank you, ma'am. So when it comes to, let's ask the first question, initially say, are we going to have new construction? So typically at right now, there is construction going on for a new area as it is right now. So that is ongoing for Fort Sam. But I'll tell you, across the Department of Defense, new construction is a little bit of a challenge because if it's not tied to a mission bed down or a weapon system, it's really, it, so it's like dorms, barracks, and ships are considered what we call current mission. So current mission quite also doesn't rank very high in the pecking order when it comes to funding because military construction, which is that new construction piece, uh, is there's a different set of rules. But in the past, Congress used to have commercial inserts that say, okay, in a dorm or a barrack or a ship, an unaccompanied facility was always a really good candidate. It was a small price and it was affecting people, right? It was their living quarters. Those are always great candidates to have commercial inserts. Well, they changed the law that says commercial inserts are no longer allowed. So the no con is now tied to mission bed downs. So will we see something soon in terms of new construction? Quite kind of sure the answer is most likely no. But that doesn't stop us from at least taking our current facilities and at least renovating those. In some cases, we're now taking the facilities literally down to the studs to where we're not really putting that lipstick on the pig per se and say we're going to just do the cosmetics. What we're also trying to do is work with Congress to give us called repair by replacement. What that means is it's just a terminology that says, I don't want to use no con, I want to use regular sustainment dollars or design and construction dollars. But if I have a building that we know is just horrible, I'm going to quote unquote replace it by building a new one wherever I want to build it on the installation. So it looks like we're playing with a different set of rules, but we're asking Congress to do that because no con is just not there. And it's not that we're trying to build a new 
addition was trying to keep the existing one moving forward. But we already looked at across JDC Enterprise, all three operating locations, Fort Sam, Mack, and Randolph. You are going to see renovations to those barracks and the ships and those drones. You're going to see that as part of our program within the next five to plus years. There's always going to be something going on in order for us to renovate those facilities and eventually get to the point where I have the crew capability where if I, if I do have something go down, I'm not trying to figure out where I go. And right now, we just don't have that coop capability, but we're going to get there. That's our plan. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. If you, if you don't know what coop means, which I didn't know at your age, <laughs> definitely, it means uh, an evacuation plan. So when the building goes down or the, or the barrack or the ship goes down, where do you go? And so that's our ability to move you to another site as quickly as possible. Possible to do something like that for our soldiers. 
Thank you so much for your question, and I appreciate that, and I apologize that that's the perception, I mean, perception's reality, but no, all of the dorms are equally important. Um, if I've said training, I apologize for that, because it's actually the permanent party dorms that brought this to our attention in the, in the first place. So we have equal emphasis on all the dorms. Um, so first of all, I'm sorry about that. Um, and then a couple of your, you know, a bunch of um, really good points that are embedded in your, in your statement in the question. So, if, you, if there are folks that are, have been uh, living in a dorm that's down for, or assuming a, a, a barracks room that's been down for several months, that's unacceptable from our standpoint. So we need to make sure that we move you to a room, even if it's to a lodging room, we can do that. We have the capability to do that. We don't, especially in this, this heat, no one should be living in something that's beyond um, acceptable uh, temperature. So please, I implore you, folks, please let your leadership know. We have a bunch of great leaders here in the room, and they're going to let us know, and we'll make sure that you're moved so we can appropriately take care of the room. Um, the regarding the dehumidifiers, um, I, I can't remember which one off the top of my head what our plan is for the dehumidifiers and the better dorms and um, the permanent party, but if we could add that to our priority list, we can do that for sure. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Richard to try to help break down some of the HVAC problems, but I'll speak from the commander point of view. And, um, any of you that are permanently, you're, you're here obviously for, for more than a couple of months, and we need you to make sure that you're in a, in a safe environment. So I will personally make sure that I'm looking at your work quarters and, and if there's rooms that have been down, we're going to get you into a, a, a room that has an HVAC that's working. Or we'll move you into lodging until we can fix it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So, uh, uh, if we've had a room where no key, not had HVAC for months, that's also a big issue for us. So, if I can give you the address also, we want to make sure we get that information. No one should have a room down for even more than a few days. I mean, that's just unacceptable. So if you're having this, uh, the tech training piece, typically what you do is we have those types of issues, you go through your military training leader, and then they, turn, they serve as your facility manager, and they let us, they work with us in order to submit that work task. That's different than the unaccompanied housing permanent party. So permanent party, you deal predominantly with, you know, my staff, which is those bear ship and dorm managers. If you're on the training side, the technical training side, you typically do that through your particular chain of command, as soon as you're your MTL or your MTI, and then they in turn will work with us in order to submit that work order. So if you have those issues within your facility on the technical training piece, definitely work through your MTI or MTL, and then they will turn to work with that facility manager for that building, and then they'll work with my staff. And what happens because it's an HVAC issue, for example, to go to my customer service um, organization, and then they turn to let Kelly Keene and his staff know, and then what we do, because we have those dedicated teams, we will dis dispatch somebody out literally that day if it's, that's an issue. So you should not have to, if you actually have any facilities where you have no HVAC for months, and you consistently no HVAC for months, then just give me the and I'll have, we'll sit down and have a conversation, because that should not be happening.
Sino, ma'am. First Sergeant Smith with 106 Sino Brigade. So I have a couple soldiers in building 272. And so on the weekend, we've had some HVAC outages. So the Mercy line goes to Lackland. And so they've been told it's not a priority. So what is the true procedure for when we receive that answer? And you have a PFC and below that can't stay in that room and they have to come out of pocket to go to the hotel. And then we've tried to change here that Richard, if he could help us with that, that's not the, the correct procedure. Um, as Richard mentioned, whenever we hear AVAC, that's a, it's a quote, it's a, a life health issue, so that should go to the top of the list, and we should deal with it right there. Um, so I apologize for your soldiers that have, have gotten that kind of service. And again, we do have the ability to put people in lodging. Um, if you remember, we had that storm the other couple of weeks ago, months ago now, and a portion I think was better dorm went down for HVAC, and we were ready to move everybody into lodging. So please don't take no for an answer. I think we should have got my cards here so you have my personal number. Um, but I'll make sure that I get my information to you, you all in particular. Um, so you have the ability to call me if you get kind of that feedback, okay? But with that, Richard, can you describe what's supposed to happen? Yes, ma'am. So, the other thing is that we're going to make this a visitation back issue. So, there's, if you're in there, there's a supporting party, and there's two ways you can call something in. So, let's say if you call customer service and send us an HVAC issue, then my, my basically, my on-call service guy is supposed to take that call and then at that point say, it's an HVAC, it's a board, we have to dispatch somebody out to go and take a look at it. That is supposed to happen. So if that's not happening, I will have our board. So the other piece of it is, is also we should have the contact to our board managers, because it's a board party, so we have two avenues to make that contact. If you also don't see it from that perspective, then also we'll make sure that you have, I'll, I'll send out all the contact information, we'll post it out somewhere, so of call my boss, you can call me, uh, that way, because I'll make certain that you will get someone out there. So there should be two lines of defense. There should be my customer service organization, and in most cases, if you're a party, it should be my real door manager who basically works for you because you're my customer. If those two do not work, then I will give you a set of numbers that we will send out that you can contact us directly on that side of the mission. Seven days a week, one project that doesn't bother us. Ma'am, gentlemen, Airman First Class Bailon reports as ordered. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that um, our MTLs are doing a great job of keeping us held to very high cleaning standards. Um, we've done so much. Uh, myself, personally, I've bought a dehumidifier for the room, um, and we're seeing very little results, which is very discouraging. Um, I've talked to other airmen who have graduated and moved on to see if operational is any different, and I was told that they don't have AC either. Um, so again, this is very discouraging as a new upcoming airman um, who plans on going operational. I graduate in September, which like I said, I was very excited for um, until I heard that there was no AC there either. Um, Another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, we've noticed that mold is growing in the closets, especially, and underneath the sinks. Um, as far as the closets are concerned, we are told that we need to keep them locked for security purposes um, because our personal items are in there. Um, so it's very hard for it to get ventilated in the daytime where there's sunlight because we're told to lock them. Um, and we're in class majority of the day, so there's very little light, and by the time we make it back to the dorms, it's, it's pretty dark outside. Um, another question that I had was in regards to reimbursement. We've spent some money on dehumidifiers and fans and other things just trying to um, fight the mold, and we don't make very much money as the A1Cs. So we were just kind of curious um, as to whether or not we would be reimbursed for those items because we can't take them with us you know, to our next phases um, on the planes and things like that. 
the work orders that we are putting in, um, there is something that's being done about it. They are coming into our rooms and they're spraying with bleach and, and different things like that. Um, however, within a few days, the mold is growing back. We've noticed it a lot on our lampshades as well, which are really old and rusted and should probably be thrown away anyways. Um, and yeah, I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your um, lots of questions there. Um, so I really appreciate you coming forward. Can I ask what door are you? That's why we're not going to see a lot of those 
so we don't continue to come back until we can basically get it done permanently. So if you're here with us, we'll try to get to it. But do you know the city fans? All these things will help. It's not just one thing that's going to solve the problem. It's not going to be just an exhaust fan. That's just a portion of the solution. So it's going to be everything we're going to want to help mitigate. So that's what we're trying to look at. It's trying to implement as many of those of that list I showed. How many of those can I do to help minimize the situation? We're not going to eliminate it, but we have to minimize it. So we'll go back and take a look at it then. If we could get your, I know we have a lot of the top energy, but not necessarily your room members. If we could get that before we leave, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, mine was more of like a, like a broader kind of. So us being like permanent party, we rely on the work orders for like HVAC and all that. So if those are supposed to be prioritized, is there a way to like guarantee it's gonna get prioritized? I know there's like a, like a million people who live here, but like you say they get prioritized, but eight months you're still living, sweating, dying. Like it's not good to live like that, but you're being prioritized, that's still kind of like degrading, you know? That goes back to Mr. Kavina's comment, trust but verify. So your, your trust is low in this case. So um, I, I apologize for that. And that's not the way we want to you know, live, first of all, nor do we want to have that kind of relationship with, with all of our, our residents in, in the village. We need to be able to trust our system. Um, I will tell you, this, is, this has been a catalyst for change. Um, so we've been changing over this past year. We've gotten new leadership in our civil engineering uh, director. That's Mr. Trevini was hired specifically for this reason, uh, to get us on track and to focus on uh, preventive maintenance, focus on uh, keeping our word, like you said, trust but verify, and you being able to rely on us, honestly. Um, so all I can say is going forward, this is, what I, this is my promise. Um, hold me accountable. Uh, you've got access, you, leadership has access, and I expect you to, to be a demanding customer, honestly. Um, there's other things that have recently changed. So there's a system called, it doesn't matter what it's called, but it's called Charter Death. It's a way to track work orders. It's going to be a lot more transparent, especially for your leadership to be able to see where your work order is in the system. But at the end of the day, that's on us. And if we say it's a priority, we need to make it a priority. So the good news is that's what the general said. I mean, the good news is the good, right? How do we get that trust is that we deliver on what we say we're going to deliver on. Now, also understanding that not every work order is the same. So we do prioritize, right? So what's the priority? HVAC, money, low, those are priorities. What do you need? They get preference. So we have three different scales of work orders in terms of priorities. We have the low decision means no key had to go get it done within 24 hours. At urges, which are typically about five to seven days, and the routines, which typically is three plus days, and I say the plus, because if it's something that's not going to impact quite honestly your room, your mission, your training, we do schedule those, but that's when we take risk in. Because it's not a matter of there's a whole wall, we don't usually be worried about it, this becomes a pest issue. We don't worry about it. We get to it eventually when we do an actual facility comp with that. Room, but we're going to focus on those things that are going to impact your ability to rest, do your mission, train, those types of those things. Now, also, that comes to mind is we do have all those old infrastructure. That's just a reality, also. So, that's not an excuse. That's just when we're being open about it, but I have to fix it. So, it's not a count upon me to worry about it, it's a count upon me to go and fix that for you. What I'm going to need your help is continue to work with your board managers and identify those problems. And if, if they're not being fixed, then elevated. Eventually, if it comes to us, I can assure you, we will have somebody out there to get fixed. And, but don't wait a week, two weeks, two months before you have those types of issues. Because at the end of the day, the board managers, they're responsible to you. They have to support you. If that's not happening, then you need to let me know. Because that's because I know what's happening. Because they work for me. Okay. So 
So I have to build your trust back. And that's why I'm here. I'm like, that's it. If your room is so, if you don't have any track that's operating, please let us know what your room is. Or if it's, it's one of those habitual down uh, for maintenance, let us know that too. If you don't mind. Um, mine was fine. Mine is back fine. But like when I first arrived here like a year ago, the work order got put in just never. And it never was seen. Uh, I'm actually just moving. And uh, it was, I've been there for a year and a half, longer than that, I stand up. And, um, it was about two years total for the big down here. So, and the, there were multiple work books put in by different roommates that moved in and out from that time, but never got addressed. Well, I'm so sorry. Um, can you, do you know the time when it came back and then we get it back on? Uh, okay. I believe it was like three months ago. Okay. That's good. All right. So, you have a little bit of this? Um, what was the word again? Uh, just just over two. Two. Well, thank you. Um, like I said, we, we focused on this this last year. We, we, we had some amazing civil engineers who were dedicated their entire lives to this craft. Um, we just don't have enough of them, too. So that's another challenge that uh, Mr. Giovanni and his team have gotten after, is hiring, <coughs> hiring more and hiring quicker. Um, so I won't go into all those details, but just needless to say, um, we have prioritized HVAC as one of our craftsmen that we have to hire more of. Um, but like I said, we have we have men and women that have dedicated decades to HVAC, and, and we have the, we have the expertise. We just don't have enough uh, to go around. Um, and we're competing with San Antonio. Honestly, if you look outside our, our gates, there's a lot of construction. Uh, there's cranes everywhere, and guess what? They have the same need. They need craftsmen, they need plumbers, electricians, HVAC, um, same guys, guys and girls that we do. So we're trying to create an environment where they want to come and work, and they want to stay, and, um, and that's, that's our challenge. But that's, like I said, that's, that's a, a, one of the main reasons why the leadership team is, is working hard, is to get those folks on board. I'm going to as quickly as we can and, and retain them. Uh, Sergeant Prince Scott Swizzwell, uh, Detachment Sergeant, HSD 56 in the battalion. I have uh, 19 soldiers in 272, and out of those 19 soldiers, every time they put work, we do inspections uh, every month, go through all the rooms, send up all the work orders. But there hasn't been any kind of tracking system for the work orders, so it's really hard to follow up on the other ones to see or multiple work orders get put into the same issue. Uh, it doesn't get resolved. Uh, they get half solutions. Right now, out of 19, I think I have six that have AC issues currently. Um, the solution has been to give them the portable, the portable AC unit, uh, which is very ineffective. Uh, unless you point it right at you, that's, that's the only part that's cool. Uh, other ones has been that the rooms have been in the low 80s. Uh, low 80s during the day, and they were said that that's fine. I've personally worked with uh, the barracks manager there, and uh, I get told the same thing. Well, we gave them a portable unit, therefore it's good. And you walk into the room, you can see the thermostat's at 78, 80, 82. Uh, so that's uh, that's consistent. It's the same work orders all the time. Uh, other ones, uh, I had three issues with door locks. I know it sounds simple, no. but for female soldiers, I had a female soldier whose door would not lock. And then when the barracks manager went there, they demonstrated that it does lock if you slam the door like incredibly hard, okay. obnoxiously. And I got told that that was it. I had to fight to get them moved. Okay. And that's, that's actually been going on these issues. If there's just any way we get better visibility, I know the, the Tri-Riga system, which, again, getting everybody access to Tri-Riga so we can actually even see these things. But even when the soldiers call on a work order, they're not given a kind of reference number, anything. Right. There should be some sort of tracking number that can be provided. So when we're calling on the work orders, we can reference previous work orders that have not been completed or the multiple times that have been called in. So they have no, they have no tracking. Well, you're absolutely right. I 100% agree with you in terms of the work order system management. Um, that That is the goal, um, so that you'll have more transparency, and so will we, honestly. But same, um, can, I, can we get those, you said 19 rooms that have had, <coughs> six have had? It's 19, 13 currently have open work orders that have been open for uh, three weeks, okay. three, four weeks. And that was a, a new time we called them in. That was after they... It's a restart, right? We restarted again, same okay. calls on all the work orders in. Uh, 13 had open work orders currently, 
Uh, six of those have that AC. Okay. If it didn't come up either now or after, we didn't. Okay. Thank you. Evening, ma'am. Uh, Corporal McDermott, 323rd Army Band. Um, are you able? Um, it's probably too soon to say, but as far as the short-term mold remediation steps, the dehumidifiers, replacing the carpets, all that, is there any sort of projected completion date at this time? So, great question. Um, one of the challenges we're having right now is actually ordering a second set of, um, a third set of dehumidifiers. So I won't go into the details, but there's you know, contracting laws about where, what countries we can order them from, and how quickly we can get them here. So um, my vice and I, my vice commander and I are just talking about that today. Um, so I can't tell you exactly, but as soon as we order them, it should take about five days to get here. So that's the dehumidifier piece. Uh, but all the other fixes that we're talking about, I'd have to be more specific about which dorm and what, what initiative we're actually discussing um, to give you a really good timeline. And if you have it. Uh, we were looking at the, the Benner uh, Barrett. The Benner Barrett dorms. Richard, uh, do you have a, a time frame for? So, so Benner Barrett is one of the first that we're going to be able to meet. We're just going to have the DC man. That is one of the ones that we're going to have right off the bat. So as soon as the dehumidifiers come in, that's going to be one of the ones that we're going to get place up. That is one of our priorities to be able to say we're going to go get them done. As soon as we get them aboard, then we're going to put them in. Other than that, that's the only timeline that I actually have. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so, for the first hand, 272, because of where it is on our prioritization to get those types of the dehumidifiers, we get those types of things, that is on our, that's one of our top priorities that will get done. Good afternoon, Special Garcia for Building 257. Um, I am allergic to and I'm normally the only one that's out, that has been diagnosed with it. Um, the, when we brought it up to the building manager, he told us to get a mold test and check the vents, then bring him the results, and as well for us to get, the, get tested for allergies. Um, another thing for the walls in the showers, they have water damage. Uh, before the high school, before in high school, I worked with my dad who has a construction company, and every time we had to remove the water, water damage, had more behind it. So it's on the walls, not just in the vents. A couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a spot clean for mold on a, on a bathtub specifically. They sprayed just they sprayed bleach all over it. And in battles, they sprayed it, they sprayed it on the vents itself. And it would just wipe down and some of it was left throughout the walls. If you're spot cleaning, then you're killing the mold in that spot, but then the rest of the system, the more still the rest of the system is being spread over throughout. So that's the limited. I, I, I missed the part about the mold allergy, but if, if you have any kind of allergy symptoms uh, that you think are related to mold, you can come to any any of the clinics on Joint Base San Antonio, and we can treat you for that. Uh, there's really good treatments, uh, kind of medicines to take care of the symptoms, and then allergy can even desensitize you. So you know, we, can, we can give you injections of, 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 of dilute mold to make you resistant to it and less likely to have an allergy. Yes, sir. On that note, I, I am going for the allergy test every week. In whenever I'm in my room, uh, doctor doctor said that my tinnitus is due to fluid being pushed in my eardrum. Whenever in my room, tinnitus gets worse. The tinnitus gets worse? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's another big word for, uh, we, have to, we have to come up with big words for, in medicine to charge all the money that we charge, at least on the outside. Tinnitus is ringing in, in one's ears. Uh, and it does have to do with fluid in, in your inner ears. Uh, but it, it, I'm not sure that we can say it, it's related necessarily to mold. Uh, is, is that what your question is? Well, CCM and my allergies have been fit, so. Yeah, so, so what, what mold can give you kind of cold-like symptoms, which might stuff up your nose and create symptoms that might cause ear symptoms, and it might, it might be related to it. So anything we can do to reduce your head cold symptoms, like what I have on the slide there, 
uh, that may or may not be related to mold. It could be just other allergies. Uh, you know, that should reduce any ear symptoms that you have. Uh, but there are, unfortunately, are a lot of things uh, that, that cause ringing in the ear. So, you know, I, I was exposed to a lot of loud general uh, noise, and so I have kind of bad hearing damage right now myself and ringing in my ears. And if you fire weapons a lot, or if you do that in a job, you, know, you got to make sure you wear hearing protection because those are other things that could cause it. But again, here at Fort Sam, the home of Army Medicine and, and Brook Army Medical Center with you know, 1,700 Air Force medics and double that Army medics, so we have all the experts. And if you're still having symptoms, then please come back and see us. I want to touch on one other option too, and I don't know if the leadership's here, but we could also look at cleaning the room, right? And maybe there's another room that's less um, causative to your to your allergies or to the ringing in your ears. Um, there's also yes, ma'am. I'm part of his leadership. Oh, okay. on the first line. Sorry about that. I'm part of his leadership. I'm on, on the first line. I'm Corporal Bordetsky. I live in the same barracks as him. No matter what room you move to. They have not cleaned the AC unit. We have talked to the building managers, Mr. Holbrook and Mr. Chen. They have admit, since that building's been built, that they're aware of, none of the AC ducts have been cleaned. I, have, too, has been dealing with issues, more so with a blocked ear. I could be gone for X amount of days because I was on a TDY for a month. Mm -hmm. Symptoms cleared up. Come back, start me get them again. It happened back in December, is when I start noticing these symptoms. I go home for leave, I'm fine, I come back to the barracks, back again. I'm still in the process going through ENT, I'm going to allergy specialists, I'm still in the process of figuring out what's causing it. But that's the only thing I can think of is mold, and plus they admit to it, that they have been cleaned. And they have no intentions in cleaning it. I've been trying to follow up week after week, same response. Go hire a contractor out of your own pocket, or if you want to get somebody else to clean it for you, we're not cleaning it. We're not cleaning it. That's um, the exact response that I've been getting over and over again. Okay. And what is your doing again? Where the NCL barracks? Which ones are? I guess it's surprised. 257. Yes. Okay. okay. We're gonna, I'm going to take a look at that one, okay? And I, don't, I can't guarantee duct cleaning. I know that's been something that we've talked about amongst ourselves. So but let me take a look at it and see what might be going on in your dorm in particular. Um, and I don't know, is there an option to move off base? Uh, yes. that I've, one other thing I wanted to mention besides with the moving off with the cleaning. This past week, I had to build out, I had to do a room inspection for my soldier, and also I reported they do spot cleaning. I think it has pos test positive, so they're coming in with a chemical light similar to bleach, cleaning just the spots where I think it tests positive, but they have not touched my room, and they have not touched his room. They only touched his tub, and only my vent that's above the tub, but did not touch my tub because I don't have any mold signs, okay. which he does okay. on his tub. And then my next question is, I've been living in that barracks for two years. Why is it that mainly the soldiers have to live in that barracks where I don't see any other branches, where they have the option to live off base? Why does the Army have to stay in there until we get E5 or the barracks across the street, air conditioning breaks down, then they move us? Okay. That's a great question, and I would be honest, I don't know the, the answer to that question, so I have to do some research to find out um, specifically why there's only an army in that dorm and why you're not allowed to move off the base. Do you have any background in that? I do. Um, so, I would just broad spectrum, I know Sergeant Major McKay has, a, has kind of a, a, a deeper dive answer on the Army side. A broad spectrum, each of the services have different requirements for dorm residency, uh, and the Air Force has a, has a different dorm requirement than the Army. Our, our requirement is three years, uh, E4 and below, uh, and quite honestly, we have kind of liberal rules as far as that requirement goes, and it, and it, and it really goes back to leadership, to, to the leadership of the member, the unit leadership. Um, so we, uh, at, at Lackland, as, as a matter of fact, uh, just as, as kind of we're, we're working through the dorm issues at Lackland, um, we've been pretty liberal with, uh, with folks that we've allowed to have BH, with the leadership has come online and said, hey, I, I'd prefer to have my folks downtown, 
um, we're okay with that, and, and so we've done that. So on, on the Army side, I know it's a, there's, there's a different requirement. I think your, your regulation is E5 and below. Right. Um, Chief, there's, there's no regulation that says E5 and below. And I, I brought this up with the not the Army under the bus. But I brought this up with the Army for quite some time, since I've been here for two years, to lower that requirement. The Army leadership has decided over and over again that they do not want E4s living off the installation. They want the E4s retained or to stay on the installation. This now is the time, the time of change, that we need to relook at that as Army leadership. And so I, I challenge the Army soldier. Um, and if you know that option is there, once you get a certain utilization rate, I believe it's 94%, that you have that option to be on that order of merit list to move off the installation. But the onus is also on the soldier that once we give you that opportunity, that you conduct yourself appropriately off, off the installation. But there's no reason why we can't match the same thing with the airports or any other city services. No reason whatsoever. And I, need, I think we need to put the new French back on the way to let, let me just address briefly the, 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 the issue of the job for uh, And so, uh, we do have occupational health specialists at Lackland and here at Fort Sam. And so, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's mold out in the air right now, spores. And there's probably some mold spores in the duct work. And so, there are some people that, even if there's no mold in your home, when you go outside uh, and the mold count is really high, it triggers a flare of mold allergies and sometimes we have to even change the medications for that. But if you're very sensitive, and so even though all the mold is cleaned out of your room, but you know the air blows in and it seems like it's making it worse, then I think you need to be evaluated. You need to see occupational health, and there are some things that we can do about that. What Mr. Trevino is going to do is to try to make the condition, as the civil engineer facility is going to try to make the conditions within the rooms less likely for any mold that happens to be in the air outside which comes in the building or maybe there's some in the in the ductwork that's been not clean for 40 years um, but from that causing growth in the room and we do that by fixing a, a leak you know, removing carpet that might have had mold in it and controlling the humidity so those of you that are going to be issued a dehumidifier it only works if it's on when, when the humidity is really high, and that's going to be from probably about the end of March to probably about mid-October. And then from we're going to have a season working for us. The air is drier in the winter, and when we go on to heating, it tends to dry out the air. So for those of you that they've, they've taken it away and you can't see it, but they're still having symptoms, we, we do have things we can do for you. And if occupational health said, hey, your room is causing this problem, that would help move you to a different place.
thank you for, for being here tonight. Um, you are, uh, you know, the heart and soul of what's going on here at Derby San Antonio. You're here for multiple years, and we really do want to make sure that your rooms are, are improving um, and that you can trust in our system and trust in us again. So with that, thanks again. Thanks to the leadership here. And this is a, a chunk of your day, too. Um, but really, to the residents, uh, thank you. Um, we're grateful for your support, and we look forward to uh, continuing to work together to solve um, the challenges that we face in